Hey everyone, thanks for joining us again. Uh, Stats is a new section that's been added to the 2019 curriculum. So uh, we're gonna get in and have a look at that now. For a lot of you, this may be some basic stuff that you've done at high school. Uh, and you may be very familiar with all of this. I know that uh, for a lot of us, we've done stats and it's an important branch of uh, mathematics. Uh, but what we're gonna do is look at this and look at you know, some key things that we need to know. You know, for instance, being able to describe those three measurements of central tendency or the averages, uh, you know, the alternative methods for calculating um, the means, uh, you know, some unusual ones that we, we can do as well. Also looking at the dispersion, standard deviation and variance and other measurements there as well. And then of course, the importance of data visualization. That data vis part is a little bit uh, interesting. It kind of almost is away from the concept of stats, but nevertheless, you know, part of the content, want to make sure that you've got that uh, as you go. Now, this session is overlapping with um, our quant course. We're doing a quant course um, for people who want to be more quantitative, but then because they're coming from lots of different backgrounds, we're setting frameworks. So, you know, there may be some terms that I'm using or explaining things uh, which are for those. We'll focus really in on the learning objectives in this session uh, and hopefully get you uh, what you need. So uh, yeah, let's get on with the slides. All right, so number one question is why bother? Why bother even with all of this? You know, I think when it comes down to it, when we deal with returns, when we deal with system testing, and remember the whole point behind statistics is that we want to observe something, we want to measure something, we want to describe that and then be able to compare it. You know, is this strategy better than that strategy? And the way we do that is with statistics. And it means that we can be impartial, we don't have any of the cognitive biases getting in our way, but we can just really focus on, um, you know, the rules that we're creating. Of course, they have to be objective rules. We, we can't have subjective analysis in this type of statistical work. That's not quite true, you know, it, let's say you're doing trend line analysis or something like that. You could go through lots and lots of charts and lots and lots of instances and you could do this manually. You could manually track. The problem is that you can't get software to do it. And that's why, you know, we say make sure it's an objective rule. It's not open to subjective biases and things like that. Uh, we, we really want to have a repeatable process. That's, I think, the most important part uh, about that. And then, of course, as we said, statistics allows us to measure the effectiveness of our results there. So there's two branches of statistics, two, two groups, descriptive versus inferential. Now, I think in this session we're going to talk more about descriptive. Uh, we're not taking sample sets and, and becoming... Uh, inferential uh, at this point, um, but you know it's important. I think those definitions there um, are what you really need to know. Descriptive statistics are measurements that we take on a population. If I go and I search for a signal in the market and I find every single instance of that signal, then uh, we can say that that's a descriptive statistic because I've found the whole population but if I go and find just a sample of them, I, I pull out a thousand signals and I do some analysis on that. And based on that, I think, okay, taking a sample, got a thousand, this is the returns that I would expect after two months. Then um, I'm going to the market or I'm putting that strategy into the market with the idea that that's the return I'm gonna get. I'm inferring that that's the, the returns that I'm get. So it's inferential statistics when we don't consider the whole population. Um, with descriptive statistics, we're not drawing any conclusions because we've measured everything. There's no inference, there's, there's nothing like that. It is purely a description of what actually happened. Whereas with um, inferential statistics, we're inferring that the measurements apply to the, uh, the whole population. So we'll often talk about this, you know, and there's some variations to calculations um, that, you know, we talk about whether it's a sample calculation or a population calculation um, as well. So the central tendency, the averages, uh, there are three main averages that um, 
uh, you need to be aware of. Again, I'm sure you've done this in high school, but we're just going to cover it quickly. You've got the mean, the median, and the mode. Now, the mean is obviously the average of the numbers. It's just adding all those values up and dividing by the number of values that we have. And, you know, there, there are examples here. Uh, you know, so if we have this set of numbers, then the mean is just adding all those numbers up and dividing it by seven, so we get the, the mean is seven. The median is the middlemost. So if we put them all in order, what is the number in the middle? Uh, and, and so if we do that and we have these all in order, you know, we can see that number six here is the middle of those seven values. So the median is six. The mode is the return or the result that occurs the most or the number that occurs most often. We've got two fives in there, so obviously five is the mode. Uh, in this case. And they, they'll all come back when we talk about probability um, in, an, in another video where, you know, we're talking about skewness and things. They're all to do with the, um, the mean, the median, the mode. It's the way we describe the data. So, you know, again, with it, these are very important measurements. Um, range, I wouldn't really call an average as such, but it's another important measurement. It's the range or the dispersion um, of the values. We'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a moment. Uh, I just want to make sure that I've covered all the notes here. Uh, averaging return. The average alone isn't a good measurement. We'll talk about that um, as well. But really important that you know those three numbers, you know what they mean, and you know um, why they're, they're um, used. So for the mean, uh, by convention, uh, the mean we, re we uh, refer to as x bar. So if you ever see a formula with x bar, then you know, that's just the average of x uh, or the mean of x. I, I want to go in this because there's so many times, and I know for a, a lot of us, you can look at formulas like this and it's just like, ah, scary numbers, scary formulas, I don't understand. So I really want to explain this as well because it really helps when we start digging into deeper statistics and things to understand the, uh, the, the different elements and what they, what they all mean. So in this case, we're saying that the average and why this is a good example is because we all intuitive know how to calculate an average. So to be able to do this and, and see it here. Now, sigma means that we're summing. So we're going to sum from um, 1 with a value of i, 1 up to n, the number of elements that we have. And so it's really just saying sum x. xi means that if I had, uh, let's say, five values I wanted to sum, well, n would be 5. Uh, and for, from value 1 to 5, I'm going to sum up those values. Uh, and so that's really all, it, all it's saying. And then we divide by n. Now, they've put 1 over n beforehand. I think this is a nicer version of it uh, where n is underneath because that's what we do. We divide by the number. Uh, it's just that this version didn't have the i, which is normally what we would write uh, when we're writing out a formula like this. So, as I said, by convention, it's referred to as x bar. Um, sigma tells us that we're summing um, rather than doing some sort of other calculation, uh, and it tells us what element's changing, and n is the number of elements. Uh, so, a couple other conventions md for median and mo for um, mode there as well. Of course, very important to realize um, that averages can be bad, like this image says, we've got the floor of averages. Um, you know, the average depth may be three foot, uh, but that could be because everything along here is one foot and then we've got a 12 foot hole. Uh, and I think, you know, it's really important when someone talks about their average returns, you know, this was my average performance. That means nothing. It really, on its own, it doesn't mean anything. You know, we really need to dig into the numbers. So, you know, a couple of examples here. These sets of numbers all return an average of five. But if I was getting returns and I was investing my money with a fund manager and, you know, this would be acceptable, getting these returns, this certainly wouldn't. You know, a 5% loss, a 10% loss, a 20% loss, and then suddenly one 75% gain. You know, honestly, I'd be looking at that saying, okay, this guy's got this one idea which is creating a lot of uh, return in this one instance. 
The other one that I'd be a little concerned about is the average of five, but they only took one trade uh, or one investment and got 5%. So you can see that the averages on their own are not so good. You know, we need to know more than just that, that single number. Uh, the dispersions, obviously, in these three cases around the average differ greatly. And that's, I guess, you know, an important thing as we go into this. So outliers, again, uh, when we're talking about the mean, the mode, uh, etc., the mean is the one that's affected the most by outliers. You know, it's most susceptible to them. Because I can have, uh, let's say, this case here, where we've got all fives. Now, Obviously simple, we know mean, median, mode are all going to be five. But if I add 20,000 to the end of this list, uh, then what I'm going to have is 20,050 divided by 11, that's 1,822. You can see that the, the median and the mode haven't changed, but the mean has gone way up. So that's why quite often when we talk about system testing and we're doing quantitative modeling and things like that, these great big outliers way off in, in massive profit. Gee, they're really nice. Um, but we don't want them to skew our results. So what we will often do is actually look at the median and work with the median instead of working with the mean. But again, out of all of those numbers, it's the mean that's the most susceptible to, um, to outliers as well. Um, as I said, very important in quantitative testing. You know, we do get those outliers, it, and they are an event, but I actually like to think of them more as a lottery trade. You know, there's a chance that you're going to put it in, and then there's going to be some piece of news that comes along, and you were just really lucky to be part, part of that trade, you know, as it skyrocketed. Um, and so, yeah, again, I, I call them the lottery trades. So the problem is that it leads us to think that our results are better than they actually are. So again, that's why we use the median. Another average calculation that does get used a lot in finance, not so much in quantitative modeling, although in some of the Monte Carlo work that we do in the Optima Backtester, we actually use a geometric mean for the Monte Carlo because uh, it's a better calculation for the types of thousands and thousands of um, results that we're uh, working with. So basically, it's, a, uh, it's an average that works on scaling um, and, and measuring the difference. So it's really good for returns, because the return is essentially a scale factor. I started with this, and I ended with that. Now, depending on what I invest, the actual dollar amount could be different, but I'm more interested in the percentage returns and how they work. Um, it's also good because it allows us to compound returns, which again is why we use this a lot. Uh, because we're usually dealing with returns expressed as percentages, we need to add one. Now, this is really interesting because, because we're multiplying, if we were dealing with a 1% return and a 1% return and a 1% return, and we just multiplied 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, those numbers get really, really small and hard to work with. Uh, similarly, if we'd had like a 200% or, or sorry, a 50% return, 60% return, and we're compounding thousands of trades together, that can become really big. And that's why we work with the geometric mean like this. What we do is we actually add one to the percentage um, every time. So uh, a 5% return becomes 1.05. Because when we multiply one by one by one, you know, it still stays at one. So it becomes a really nice way of doing this math. But here's the, the formula for it. So instead of this sigma that we had before, we now have this capital pi um, symbol. And that says to us exactly like sigma was, we're gonna sum all these values. This just means that we're gonna multiply all these values. So we multiply all the values that we ha have from our first value to our last value. And then we, we raise that to the power of one over the number. Now, if I had two numbers, uh, let's say, you know, I've got it here, uh, minus 20 and 22, well, then this would be one over two. And so when I raise something, so, you know, if I raised it by two, I'd be squaring it. When I raise it by one over two, it's the square root. One over three would be the cube root. So, you know, that's how the, the, the math works uh, in that one. And you can see that example here that all of this 
simplifies to this type of um, statement as well. But if I look, and you can see here this example which shows how important this is. If we had two returns, so two annual returns, we got a minus 20% loss in the first year, 22% gain in the second year. Well, if I calculate the average returns of those two, I would take the minus 20 and the 22, divide that by two, and it tells me that on average, I actually made a 1% return. But see, it's not um, factoring in the compounding nature of these investments. You know, so if I'd started with 100 uh, and then I had a 20% 20 20 loss, well then at the end of that year, I've got $80. Uh, and then if I made a 22% gain, I've actually got 97.6. I'm still below my starting point two years earlier. So you know, that's why we can't just average returns. We have to use the geometric mean for them. So the geometric mean is the square root uh, of 0.08, so we add one, but because it was a negative 20% return or negative 0.2, we take that 0.2 off one, and that leaves us at 0.8. Uh, so we have 0.8 times 1.22, we add the 22% to one, uh, and then we subtract that one away from it at the end. So again, the geometric mean, these calculations, we add these ones to the percentages, but then right at the end, we take the one away again. Uh, and that leaves me a minus 1.2%. Now that's much more um, representative of the loss that I had. You know, $100, if I'd lost 1.2%, it'd be uh, uh, $1.20. Um, but then losing that again, uh, you know, you can see that I'm getting to the number that I had there. So on average, we lost 1.2% um, per year. But that's the geometric mean very often used in finance, uh, an important one to understand um, as well. Uh, do another example here, just to sort of really um, go through this, put this in a Excel. Uh, you can download this Excel if you wanna play with the numbers and see the formulas that I used. So what I've done is taken the S&P 500 index returns, the yearly returns for the last 10 years. Uh, so here we've got the returns that they're listed. And then I create a factor of that. So this is just that process of adding one and then adding one to the, um, the percentage return. So in this case, it's 0 0.615, a 23.5% positive return gives me 1.235. Uh, and so from that, I can multiply them all together. I get 1.8. I can take the 10th root uh, of that, which is basically saying this. I'm putting 1 tenth here and it gives me 1.062, get rid of the one, gives me 0.062, which is a, a geometric mean of 6.2% return over, you know, per year over the, uh, the 10 years that we were looking at there. So again, you can see the difference. You know, if I just did a straight average, it would say it was an 8% return, uh, but the 6.2% is a geometric mean. So again, just an important one to um, know. Now, I alluded to this before, important to keep in mind this whole concept of a population versus sample. So when we talk about descriptive and inferential, the population is all the data, you know, everything we do. You know, we could, if we could measure everything, you know, the mean would be a descriptive statistic. Um, but if we take a sample, so if we go to this population and we pull out a sample and we do all our analysis on the sample, then we're inferring that that sample is representative of the population. Obviously, the bigger our sample is, the, the higher the probability that our sample will be a good representation. Um, but even though we, you know, because we haven't measured everything, it is an inferential statistic uh, that, um, that, that we think applies to the, uh, the population. So, and I'm gonna come back to that. I, I wanted to throw that slide in there because we do have a little variation in some of these dispersion calculations based on whether we're measuring a population or we're measuring a sample. Um, so again, averages, they give us a clue about the returns that have occurred, uh, but it's a single number. Uh, and you know, whilst it's very descriptive, it fails to give any idea about how close or how far the returns. You know, that example of averages I gave with the, the wide variation of returns. Um, dispersions around the mean describe our volatility. So when we talk about, you know, you think of Harry Markowitz and the efficient um, 
uh, portfolio and efficient frontier and, and the mean variance portfolio construction that he did in the 1950s. Um, what, you, what you see is he took a lot of this concept. This was back in the, in the 60s. He was doing this work where he was looking at portfolio construction from a point of view of let me find the portfolio that has the best returns for a fixed amount of risk or you know, for the lowest risk. And so that was a lot of that work. But in most cases, the way they defined risk was the variance around the average returns. Uh, and you know, it, it's an interesting one and it's something where I think there's still more work needs to be done because um, when we talk about the mean, we've got returns which are below and we've got returns which are above. Now, most measures that we use, like standard deviation, we'll talk about that in a moment, they measure the dispersion above and below. And because that dispersion is great, it says that the risk is great because we've, we've uh, said that the dispersion is a, uh, you know, it's basically the risk uh, that we take on with this investment. The problem with that is, you know, we, we really look at positive returns or positive outliers as good. They're not bad. Uh, and so that's why they're, they're, there's funny, and that's where some of the other ratios, uh, like the Kalmar ratio and, and uh, things like that, can talk about only downside risk versus downside and upside. Uh, but, you know, that's something for later on uh, as we get a little more down the statistics path um, as well. But important to keep that in mind, that volatility is the best measure we have at the moment. Um, uh, you know, so risk is the best measure of volatility we have at the moment, but there really needs to be more work on upside versus downside uh, as well. All right, so range and mean deviation. So looking at these, these are four types, um, range, mean deviation, uh, variance and standard deviation. Now range is obvious, it's just the highest um, minus the lowest observed value. Uh, that's, that's easy. The mean deviation, not used that often. Standard deviation is much more common, but it's still one which is good to know. We're basically saying, let's sum up all of the differences. So if we have a mean, we, we get all these numbers and we have a mean of nine, then we measure how far away was this observation from the mean. So at 16, it's seven above. And so that is what goes in here. Now, these lines mean absolute value of, uh, which means that this one here, which would be a negative six, because it was six under, we just get rid of the negative and we just make it six. We're just looking at what we would say the absolute value of the observation from the mean, uh, and then we divide that by the number of observations, uh, and that gives us our mean deviation. Uh, variance. Again, going into this, so variance is similar to mean deviation, but it just uses a different method of getting rid of the negative values. Instead of taking the absolute value, it actually squares the result because a negative number squared becomes a positive number. You know, minus two times minus two becomes four. So uh, that was another way of getting rid of the, the squaring factor, or, or the, sorry, the negative numbers uh, that we have there. And so we represent variance by sigma squared, uh, and you can see that uh, function there. Um, when the calculation is performed, now it's very important here, so you see these two functions that I have, or these two equations. In the bottom one, I have n minus one. This is why I was talking about population versus sample. In population statistics, we would just measure all of the results and we would uh, take the variance and we would divide by the number of results and that's it. When it comes to sample um, distribution, because we know that there is a little bit of a fudge factor going on and it, you know the, the sample may not properly represent everything, uh, by convention, what we do is we just take one off. So if there was 10 observations in our sample, we would divide by nine. It gives a little bit of an inflation to our um, variance. Uh, but the other thing that's nice about that is that when we have a small sample set, that makes that number 
much bigger. So for instance, if I had a sample of two, I pulled out two um, results. Well, instead of dividing by two, I'm only dividing by one. That makes a massive increase to my variance. But if I have a thousand um, results, then instead of dividing by a thousand, I'm dividing by 999. And that's great because it means that the bigger my sample is, the less that this impacts um, my variance calculation. But nevertheless, just keep an eye on that. Uh, I think in the CMT textbook, they refer to it as this. They're giving the, the equation for the sample um, variance, um, but if it was population variance, it'd just be that uh, with dividing by n instead. So standard deviation then is purely getting rid of the square of sigma. And so standard deviation, we call it sigma. Uh, sigma equals the square root of everything that we had in the, uh, the previous slide there. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, an easy one there too. Now, obviously, when we talk about um, averages and standard deviations, they become the two most common um, numbers that we work with. So the, the average returns and the standard deviation of returns, that's that mean variance um, style. It's, it's funny because we talk about, like Harry Markowitz talks about mean variance, but in actual fact, they often use standard deviation more as variance. And the reason being is that because we've taken the square root of that variance, it's now put it back into a range similar to our average. Uh, so, you know, when we're squaring it, that number's bigger and it makes the variance number look bigger than what it necessarily should. But bringing it back into the same scale is an important thing to do as well. Because when I look at an average, I can look at that and I can say, okay, my average is 10%, my standard deviation is 5%. It means that I can expect returns, 66% of my returns, to be from 5 through to 15% um, returns. Uh, and they're all on the same scale. So that's why, you know, it's... it's um, Important. A couple examples here. Uh, mu is another way that we describe the average, and sigma uh, 2, you can see the shape there of that. Uh, we've got 14 uh, and 2, and then we've got 14 and 3, and you can see how the distribution of returns changes uh, when our standard deviations get bigger uh, as well. Now, this is more of like a warning about statistics because we can sit there and we can find these measurements and we can calculate them and they're really good for describing, um, you know, what results we're looking at. But we still have to be able to visualize the charts. We still have to be looking at our results because the stats alone are, are never enough. Now, this one, um, ANSCOM's uh, quartet, was a set of charts created in 1973 um, by Francis uh, Anscom. And basically all four of those charts, they have the same mean, they have the same variance, they actually have the same correlation and regression lines. We'll talk about those in later sessions uh, and the coefficient of determination. So all of these really important descriptive statistics are all the same for all of those four. But when we look at those charts, we know it's different. We know that there's, um, you know, those stats aren't properly describing. So again, just got to be aware of that, that, that stats are important, um, but there are limitations, you know, because at the end of the day, it's a summary. These, these are summary numbers, which are taking a wide set of data and giving us a number, but behind that number is a lot of information. Returns distributions are something which is important. Um, you know, each bar, that we have in a returns distribution or each bin uh, represents a, you know, a set of values. So for instance, these are 1% bins, meaning that any re returns that I got, so this is Dow Jones weekly changes. So for the 52 weeks of the year, we've measured um, what was the percentage change and put them into bins. So if it was a half percent um, uh, return, then it would go into this bin here from zero to 1%. If it was one and 1.1% 1 .1 return, well then it would go into this bin here between one and 2%. So we divide up all the returns like that. We count how many observations, uh, and you know, which is called the frequency here, uh, and we have this chart. So we can see here 
that we had 10 weeks between uh, 2 and 3% return uh, and 11 weeks between 0 and 1% return. Uh, so again, we look at that and we do these distributions to try and get an idea of, okay, well, what are the likely returns? What are the returns that I can expect uh, coming out of this security that I'm looking at? Call it a frequency distribution because it's counting how many times we get those returns. Uh, again, we have lots of samples. You know, we do. Um, you know, when we when we have lots and lots of results and we're doing the frequency distribution, sometimes the actual number. So here we were counting up here. That can sometimes not really be um, that meaningful. And so it's better then to put it into a probability of occurrence. And that's simply saying count the frequency, you know, if we had 10 and then divided by the total number of observations that we have or the sample size. And then we get what we call a probability distribution because it's telling us, right, for this level here, let's say the value five, I've got a 0.24 or 0.25 um, or 25 percent chance uh, that that's going to occur. Um, I think it's probably 0.25 percent chance. I, I can't quite tell what those numbers are on this plot that I got. But but we're turning each of those values and each of those frequencies into a probability, uh, and so that's the other way that you'll see these distributions uh, represented. Sometimes. It's as the actual frequency distribution. Other times it's a probability distribution. So a couple of other um, plots that are, or charts or visualizations that are talked about in the text, the CMT text, um, you know, with this, we're talking about looking at the daily returns as a box and um, whisker. So the way this one works is that we have the mean, we've measured the mean returns over the, the past year. Uh, looking at all the daily returns there, 252 odd um, days. What was the average return? Uh, one standard deviation up, one standard deviation down, highest observed return, lowest observed return. In Optima, we also show where we are in this day. You know, so when I took it, we just had a big down day early December 2018. Um, and so uh, a lot of these things are down. But nevertheless, we can look at that and say, hey, all of these have very similar average return. You know, these FANG stocks, there's very little difference between them, um, but Facebook has obviously had a lot more volatility when looking at its range, its dispersion like that. But looking at standard deviation, Netflix has got the biggest standard deviation um, move there, uh, whereas obviously Facebook's got some outliers uh, in the data. All right, scatterplot returns. So again, scatterplots looking at two stocks and saying, let me measure the weekly returns on one and what the weekly returns are on the other. And then plot that on an XY plot. And we're looking at that to say, hey, are they highly correlated? And we talk more about correlation and regression in, in later sessions in CMT2 uh, as well. Um, but nevertheless, it's a good plot to look at um, and see you know, whether these two stocks are highly correlated. So if they were really close together around that line, then we would say these are highly correlated and you know, they're gonna move together. Now, from a portfolio diversification point of view, well, we may not wanna put both these stocks in our portfolio because we're not gonna get the benefit, uh, because they're so highly correlated, they're just moving in tandem all the time. So we may as well just have one or the other, uh, et cetera. Um, so again, you know, that's something that's mentioned in the text, but we'll come back to that in a lot more detail in, in later sessions. All right, so uh, that's it. Introduction to descriptive statistics. Uh, again, those uh, three most common measures of central tendency, the mean, the median, the mode. Make sure you know those, those calculations. The alternative um, calculations, the geometric mean, uh, is probably the number one, and then understand where that's being used and, and how it's being used. The text also talks about weighted averages. I didn't go into that in this session because we cover that in averages um, anyway. Uh, and I think that you know, you're gonna get enough of that there, but it's simply that each value can have a weight associated with it um, as well. Measures of dispersion, I talked about four of them, but the two that you really have to know is obviously variance and standard deviation. Uh, make sure you understand those. And then the importance of data visualization. It's because those numbers 
uh, that we have as statistics may not really be fully describing everything. So again, make sure that, you know, you would go back and look at charts. We go back and look at the probability distributions. We look at the curves uh, and see how things are actually spread out, uh, and, you know, when we're actually using them. So that's it for this one. Uh, we'll continue on with probability next. Thank you.